everybody. This practice problem comes from Economics by R. Glenn Hubbard and Anthony Patrick O'Brien, 4th edition. We're going to be doing Chapter 3, Problem 1.8. This problem asks us for a sequence of different events. What will result in a movement along the demand curve for McDonald's Big Mac hamburgers, and what will result in a shift of the demand curve? For McDonald's hamburgers. It says if the demand curve shifts, indicate whether it will shift to the left or shift to the right and draw a diagram to illustrate the shift. So we can actually start up front and we can draw our different possibilities. So the first possibility that we want to think about is a movement along the demand curve. And again remember the demand curve just shows quantity on the horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis. We can draw a downward sloping demand curve because we have our law of demand. We get demand curves to look like this. And a movement along the demand curve is just a movement from one point to another on the same demand curve. And we generally see movements along the demand curve when we see the change in price of our item. And we see shifts in the demand curve when things other than price are changing that affect demand. So on that note, we could have, you know, here's our movement along. We could draw an increase in demand, and we could draw a decrease in demand as well. We could say here, let's draw a shift to the right. And a shift to the right, we know, is an increase in demand. I'll show why in a second. And we can also have a shift to the left, which is, of course, a decrease in demand. And we know by now that a shift to the right looks something like this. And we can see that this is an increase in demand because at any given price, right, price is here, at any given price, consumers are demanding more of an item than they were before. So an increase in demand is sh you can think about as a shift to the right, and a decrease in demand for the same reason we can think about as a shift to the left. So in that case here, we have our original demand curve, and then our new demand curve would be something here. Now, of course, they don't have to be parallel shifts, but this is fine for illustrative purposes. And again, our decrease in demand is a shift to the left because at every given price, consumers are demanding fewer units than they were before. So we've drawn these three possibilities and now we just have to figure out where the scenarios fit in terms of these possibilities. So let's check this out. So part A says, the price of Burger King's Whopper hamburger declines. So just as a reminder, this is for McDonald's. So the McDonald's Big Mac, right? So we have to think about what determinant of demand is affected here when we're moving around the price of a different good. If we're moving around the price of a different good and it's actually going to affect the demand for our good, it has to be a related good. And our goods can be related in one of two ways. They can either be substitutes, things that are consumed instead of a Big Mac, or complements, things that are consumed basically together with a Big Mac. I'm pretty sure that people consume Whoppers instead of Big Macs. So the Whopper is actually a substitute for the Big Mac. So again, we can come back here and we say we have a price decrease of our Whopper. So we think about this. We have a decrease in price of a substitute. Some people are gonna switch over from Big Macs to Whoppers. We're gonna be left with a decrease in demand or a shift to the left of our demand curve because prices of related goods is a determinant of demand that's not price, so we are in fact getting a shift, and we're getting a shift to the left. And we can say here, this is part A, 
we can label this and say that we're getting a shift to the left because part A is describing a scenario where we have a price decrease of a substitute good, which we know is going to lead to a decrease in demand for our good, which is a shift to the left. So part B says, McDonald's distributes coupons for a dollar off the purchase of a Big Mac. So if everybody has a coupon for a dollar off, what McDonald's has effectively done is lower the price of a Big Mac by a dollar. So if that's how we're thinking about it and we're taking the post coupon price as the real market price that we're looking at, that's going to give us something here, right? That we're not going to be shifting the demand curve because we're not changing a non-price determinant of demand. We're only getting a different point on the demand curve because the price has in fact changed. So again, the $1 off coupon is a decrease in price of the good itself, which is going to lead to a movement along the demand curve. And it's actually going to lead to this movement here. But I could label this B for part B of our question. Because if the consumer got a dollar off coupon, then they're experiencing a price decrease. The quantity demanded of Big Macs will increase, but it's increasing because the price decreased, not because of some other factor. Part C says, because of a shortage of potatoes, the price of french fries increases. So we can think about again, we're told something about the price of a good that's not the one we're looking at on these graphs, right? These graphs are all Big Mac graphs, and we're just told about the change in price of something else. So we said, hmm, again, what determinant of demand would that be? Well, this is going to affect demand for Big Macs if this good is in fact a related good. So again, comes back to this question of substitutes versus complements. So do we consume French fries instead of Big Macs, or do we consume French fries in conjunction with Big Macs? Does having French fries make the Big Mac more appealing and vice versa? Seems like to some degree, yes. So what we're actually seeing is we're seeing an increase in price of a complement or complementary good. And we know that that's going to put us back here. That this is going to be part C, that we have an increase in price of a complement. And we know based on the rules of our determinants of demand, when we have an increase in price of the complementary good, some people are going to say, eh, I only wanted a Big Mac because I got the fries to go with it. Now I don't really want the fries, so I don't want the Big Mac either. It's going to lead to a decrease in demand for the thing that we're actually looking at. And of course, a decrease in demand is a shift to the left of the demand curve. Part D says fast food restaurants post nutrition warning labels. So this is something that we sort of see happening. We don't see warning labels per se, but we see calorie counts, which are supposed to scare people into not eating as much fast food or something. But if they're explicitly warning labels, it seems like what would be happening is people would be turned off to fast food, right? And we can go through our determinants of demand. Say, so did the price change? No. Did our income change? No. The price of a related good change? No. So what's actually changing? And what's actually changing is people's tastes for Big Macs. So we can say that the warning labels are actually decreasing people's tastes for Big Macs. And a decrease in taste is going to lead to a decrease in demand. And again, we're back here. We're very optimistic about our demand here, apparently. So part D is also going to look like this, but it's because we're looking at a decrease in taste, which is going to correspond to a decrease in demand, which is, of course, a shift to the left of the demand curve. And part E says the US economy enters a period of rapid growth in incomes. So what we said before, income is certainly a determinant of demand, but we actually need more information to know what effect a change in income is going to have. So we need to think about, well, is fast food what we would call a normal good, where income and demand move in the same direction? 
Or is fast food what we would consider an inferior good, one where income and demand move in opposite directions? And that's basically asking the question, as people get richer, you know, as that same dude gets richer, does he consume more Big Macs or fewer Big Macs? For most people, Bill Clinton notwithstanding, as they get more wealthy or get higher income, they probably consume fewer Big Macs because they're switching over to better food, or fancier food at least. So we can probably think of Big Macs as an inferior good. And if we think of Big Macs as an inferior good, this increase in income is actually going to lead to a decrease in demand or a shift left of the demand curve for Big Macs. So we can put that here. We can say that we have an increase in income that we're contending with and we have an inferior good, which is going to tell us then that we're again experiencing a decrease in demand for Big Macs. So again, notice here we had five different scenarios. When that scenario involved just changing the price of the item itself, we didn't shift the demand curve. We just went from one point to another. But when the scenario involved shifting something that was a determinant of demand but wasn't the price, wasn't the thing that was explicitly graphed, we instead got a shift of the demand curve. And as it turns out, all of our scenarios here led to a decrease in demand for Big Macs, and a decrease in demand is a shift to the left of the demand curve.